you know, Sangram is an American painter, but he references everything from Kali Ghat to uh, Madhubani to miniature painting. So how is that read in America and how is that uh, read at home? So with that, I now hand over and uh, let John take it forward. Hello, I'm, <laughs> I'm John Yao, in case it's not clear. I <laughs> thought I would uh, provide a little background because some of you are seeing uh, Shangram's work for the first time. Uh, I have a long history with him. I first wrote about him in 2009 when we were both younger. <laughs> <clears throat> So I, I just will read what I wrote. I would like to thank Ranjana and everyone at the gallery as well as the many people I've met uh, in the last few days for making my first trip to Mumbai so memorable. Uh, before Shangram and I begin what I hope will be an illuminating conversation about his work, I thought I'd give a little background to it and how I came to know it and think about it. I first wrote about his work in 2009 when his work was included in the group exhibition 25 Painters Under 35 at the Painting Center in New York City. Since then, I've reviewed his exhibitions a number of times starting in 2012, as well as included a painting of his in the exhibition Broken Window Plain at Tracy Williams Gallery in 2012, where I brought together both figurative and abstract artists to suggest commonalities and differences in how they might be entwined. In 2013, I made the following observation about Shangun's work, which still seems to hold true. And here's the quote. It seems to me that Majumdar is after that moment of seeing, which, just, which occurs just before we name the object, event, or experience, and begin looking for the next thing, whatever it is. He wants to discover if, by peeling away all the obvious pointers, he can locate the subject on, a, on its perceptual threshold, separate on the perceptual threshold separating seeing from naming <clears throat> at this at that juncture even if viewers can name what they see the work will exceed or or and subvert languages attempt to encapsulate he wants to he wants he seems to want viewers to sense they have lost their way and are now looking at something devoid of reassuring landmarks, including such, such terms as abstraction and representation. I see this as a risky gambit, as well as a conscious challenge to a media besotted world that revels in names and naming, as if somehow everything can be accounted for, safely categorized, and subsequently copied. Well, I believe this observation continues to be relevant to Shangram's work, the work itself has substantially changed over the past decade. He's never had a signature style, doesn't return to the same, or, or doesn't return to the same subject. For example, in 2009, one of his subjects was an ironing board over which clothes were hung. In 2012, he painted a woman going through her travel bag and titled it As If. In these representational works, what we saw was an in-between moment. Everything was in a state of flux. In 2018, he used colored tape to draw a child running, collectively titling these drawings In Motion. One of those works he titled Giacometti's shadow. Yesterday, while we were at the museum looking at an exhibit of Asian sculpture with a particular focus on India's many different kinds of work, he asked me if I knew whether or not Giacometti, who was influenced by Egyptian art, may have also been influenced by Asian sculpture. 
Shankram's question reflects his deep sense and breadth of art history. At the same time, it reminded me that Shankram, who was born in Calcutta, left India when he was 13, a crucial period in anybody's life, and moved to Phoenix, Arizona, Phoenix, the name of a bird that rose from the ashes of burning itself on a funeral pyre so that it could be reborn. What death and rebirth did young Shankram undergo when his family uprooted him and moved from India to America? More importantly, or perhaps just as important, what births and deaths and ruptures gave birth to Shang in Shankram's mind to how this might have affected his work, right? So that's sort of where I want to start, but I want to mention one other thing. I was particularly reminded of all these th things when during dinner at a Chinese restaurant in Mumbai, he said he wanted to make a break with the tradition of Western painting, a tradition that I will say he certainly knows and works in and has done many significant paintings in. What does it mean to want to make a break with something you know so well? So that's where I want to start. <laughs> I didn't want to start light. <laughs> um, well, first, thank you all for being here. I mean, yes. this is incredible. Um, thank you to Ranjana, thank you to Disha, thank you everybody who's been so amazing um, during my time here. Um, I think John and I were both talking, we have to come back. Mm -hmm. We have to come back. Yes, we have to come back. Yes, yes. Um, so, what was your question? What births and deaths? What births and deaths have you had? No, I mean, we'll, we'll start a little smaller. So I'm a cat. <laughs> uh, okay. What, you said yesterday yeah. that you wanted to make a break with Western oil painting. Right, right. And. And that doesn't mean you give up oil painting right, and you become right. a video artist. It right. does mean something important, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I guess maybe, um, obviously, that's like a large like framework, right? Like any, any tradition and um, Western painting has its tentacles um, out, that moves outwards, um, is far-reaching. Um, I guess what I was thinking, or what I've, the way I've developed, um, part of it is subconscious or unconscious. And I would say it's unconscious, then it's subconscious, and then it's conscious. Right. Um, in the sense that everybody develops probably initially by mimicking, you know, whether it's music or, um, you know, I Language. remember, right, right, I remember right. as a kid in Kolkata, like doing, um, um, you know, poetry uh, recitals and where you have to memorize poems and recite. Um, and um, I used to copy uh, images, I guess. Um, and then, but then moving, you know, to Arizona, primarily, you know, it's a, it's a, when I say Western, I also mean a certain kind of Eurocentric space. So I don't mean like broadly, like, so, you know, I didn't have any non-Western, um, teachers uh, at all. Um, but I think I was just like open. Um, I think I've always drawn and painted and uh, I've always been interested in um, imagery that was somewhat tied to the world. Even as a kid, I used to invent images where I would take the Sunday statesman newspaper that had color images of cricket players and I would cut them out and make my own compositions or go to like Durga Pujo and like sit on the floor. So it wasn't and, baseball players, it was cricket players. Yes, yes That's course. important. That is very important. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is as I've developed uh, over time and then going to art college, um, you know, you get kind of like sucked into the narrative, right? Um, and I was so invested in just like growing and I was interested in imagery and, and I found there was this natural alignment of how I saw how my, how my hand moved, um, that it moved in a certain pathway, 
like it didn't move into kind of postmodern image-based painting. It moved, mo moved more towards material-oriented um, um, making, uh, which was much more naturalistic. Um, and I think there are reasons for that, I've realized. Um, I like the facture, I like uh, how things feel when they're made by hand. And um, so anyway, as the work developed and I was beginning to show and I realized that the conventions um, that my work were part of didn't, like what the work looked like didn't align with how I actually felt. Sure. Uh, or what I was... That's a big thing from people of color yeah, in America. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about, right. which is a kind of interstitial in-betweenness. Like, right. And I think, you know, what you're referencing, this in-between place, I started exploring that by kind of creating hybrid spaces, hybrid setups and things like that. And, at a, and then finally I realized that I had to make like a bigger, bigger jump um, and I think around 2012 or so is when I really started taking some of the stops out, um, which meant, um, you know, like consciously, that's what I mean by the subconscious, or the, uh, the more conscious decision to really make some decisions that visually departed from, you know, certain traditions within Western painting, right. historical traditions, right. not contemporary traditions. Right. Right. So once you started to take things out, yeah. So in his early work, he like they were setups. He would he would set up a scene and he would then paint it. So it was like a stage set. So I actually think these you can see as a kind of stage set mm -hmm. with characters in them. Mm -hmm. In those early paintings, they had to do with family. Mm -hmm. And then slowly you moved away from that. It's sort of you went out into the world. Right. So now I wouldn't say that any of these figures are exactly you, even though clearly in the painting behind me they right. reference you. Yeah, I think I've always, I think one thing I've realized, and this group of paintings try to address directly, is how do you, um, and I think Ranjana mentioned this, like, how do you both implicate yourself? How are you present in the work? But then how do you also pull in um, the things that you're drawn to? And even though you're not sure why you're drawn to them, or you feel somewhat uncomfortable about being drawn to them. Like, you know, like when I began to really study and explore a kind of a wider gamut of Indian traditions, there are certain elements within the work that felt natural for me, even though, you know, it, you know, and I found also a certain alignments with uh, uh, different types of medieval painting, Western medieval painting. Um, and I think I've always been interested in how things interlock visually, uh, if I just think of how images are constructed. So, yeah, I think I, for me, it's been important to um, like figure out what I've been calling is how do you bring these voices, these ghosts, these ancestors back forward, you know? And without being nostalgic. Without being nostalgic, but, and how do you like imprint them into the work? How do you make them come forward? And I guess it's a little bit like the notion of like when you you know, in certain traditions, but praying is a way of calling forward uh, and acknowledging that they exist. Uh, our remembrances are a way of like imaging or manifesting something that isn't there. Um, so for me, you know, the scale of the work, the actions, um, and even the way they're painted is really, the gesture is very important for me because it's a way of kind of creating a sense of nowness um, as opposed to something where it functions purely as an image that that kind of still that still like yeah, a still I, life right, right. still life is not going to move but right. if you look at this painting you see the figure's foot moving out of the picture frame right as if it's stepping into our world yeah. right one of the things actually Clement Greenberg said that was the biggest break with traditional Western painting 
was that Pollock made a painting that existed in the same space that we do. Right. And somehow I felt like, wait, this does the same thing. It's not, yeah. it's not abstract expressionism, but it is existing in the same space. And what is the space that we share, which you leave open? Right. right. And I think that sense of openness, I've become more comfortable with openness. And I think that I, I was rereading an earlier, one, a really early interview, not uh, with John Seed, and I think it was 2009. And I think at, in there I, I said something about this notion of more is more. And I think I used to like pack things in. And I remember around 2016, um, um, and I was doing these paintings that John was referring to, these kind of stage set dioramas um, that I would paint from. Um, there were no figures in them, everything was, but there were clearly anthropomorphic forms that referred to the body. And so it was 2016 in the US, the election had just happened. Um, and um, I think there was, and then my daughter was also born the same year. And I think that was the first time I felt like um, that like um, I needed to like, it was like too stressful or something. Like I needed to like <laughs> clean house, like I needed to move things. And then uh, uh, someone said to me like, well, if everything's in the painting, you know, and if it's like, like what's, you know, what's, you know, where did it come from? Like what's the space where these things came from or like, in the sense that if it's a room and you move furniture from the right side of the room to the left side, what does that space now feel like? So I started actually making these really empty spaces. They were very minimal, um, devoid of any forms. And I think that was like the catalyst where I started to become comfortable with openness. Um, and I think these paintings are um, in conversation. There's, there's events and then there's, um, uh, there's happening, things happening, forms that you can name, but then there's just void spaces that function yeah. as, uh, as an um, atmosphere, in a sense. Right, as in that painting over there, right. under that figure that's whispering, mm -hmm. there's that red, and mm -hmm. is it, what is it? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that strikes me about your paintings is that in every painting, we see something that we think we can name or know, and then we we pulled into the painting, mm -hmm. and then we realize there's something that we can't name, and are right. we willing to accept mm -hmm. that? I mean, we accept it when we walk around in the world, right? Right. right. There's things you see, and you go, "Oh, I know what that is," but I can say, walking around Mumbai, I, I would look at something and go, "What is that?" But I don't say it can't exist because I don't know what it is. Right. I mean, it's there in front of me, and yeah. it's true in the painting. What is that, all those blue lines? What's that red? Mm -hmm. How come we can't see the figure on the left side? Mm -hmm. And yet, do we accept that? I mean, we, we, there's a kind of egotism to humans that believe they have to name everything, mm -hmm. but there's a kind of humility in existing in the work world where we can't name everything, but we know we have to kind of exist anyway, mm -hmm. right? Well, I think, so there are a couple of things I, I was thinking about. Um, so to go back to this kind of field, um, you know, I, I know when I'm working on these, I, I'm very aware at sometimes I think of that, I think of a wall and how a wall can be something you look past, like if you're on the outside, so the wall functions as a barrier and then you move into a space, like these columns, and you move through. Or the wall is the thing that is at the very back, that things come out from, right? So in a way, it's a kind of a accordion space, a space that can bellow backwards and forwards. Um, and that, I think, is a, something I'm really thinking a lot about in these paintings. Um, but, and I think in terms of this naming, I think I've become more comfortable saying, I don't know, you right. know? And I think there's something I, like, uh, like I don't know, I know it's here, and, and how do I um, acknowledge that? 
uh, that level of existence without taking it to a point where it is, um, you know, nameable in a certain way. Like how much do we need to see? How much do we need to know? How much do we need to, um, uh, how much does it have to kind of um, agree with our um, narrative or with our expectations, right? right? Which then kind of feeds into cultural expectations. Um, you know, if you're existing within a kind of a, you know, within a space that is, uh, and you, you know, you feel you're kind of in the minority, like there is this conversation always about performing. Uh, you know, like, and this very clear awareness of, you know, um, like, how do I appear, you know, or how should I appear? That, well, that's a, this is a particularly American, uh, for me. Yeah. I mean, if you're a person of color in America, mm -hmm. like, all Chinese Americans are supposed to be the model minority. Right. Right. We're supposed to be well behaved and we work really mm -hmm. hard and mm -hmm. we love our parents blah, blah, blah. But we know there are exceptions to that. Exactly. And there are people who rebel against that. I mean, my mother, right. my mother was happy that her son was going to become a poet, but mm -hmm. my father thought I should become a lawyer or a doctor, send them money when they got older, which I refused to do. You know what I mean? This, yeah. it, you know, you how but, do you define your own individuality? But also, like, at Jeet Patel's this incredible um, event yesterday when, um, you know, they're talking about the good, the good Jeet and the bad, you know, like the good doctor and, and that, you know, that basically everyone is uh, kind of a combination of multitudes, if I want right. to you know, yeah. go, that, go uh, there. Um, yeah, well, Whitman, I contain multitudes. Right. Exactly. But even like when I go back and visit my uncles and my family in Kolkata, like I was just there, there is always like this question of like how, so I don't, I don't want to necessarily say that it's just this kind of binary of somebody of color in a white space or right, vice right. versa, but it's really about, we're always, I think everybody's always negotiating how they are around in the world, like when we talk to our friends versus when we talk to our parents or when we're at work, you know, this notion of uh, the stranger, you know, or the, and I think that's where with these figures, um, I'm thinking a lot about like, you know, what is it to appear as a silhouette or a shadow? What is it to appear purely as a kind of um, a line drawing, you know, or Yeah, let's appear... talk about that painting. Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's a kind of, in all of your paintings, there's a record of what went before. Right. So he exposes himself mm -hmm. by not covering that up, right? Right. But this reminded me at one point of a Harlequin, the tragic Italian figure. And then, but at the same time, it's not a Harlequin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, right. what is it? Right? And yeah. I like not knowing, mm -hmm. but feeling like there's a kind of tragedy or tragicness to that mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm and yet you don't articulate it so clearly. We kind of fill it in. It's almost like the viewer completes the painting. What, what is the tragedy? Who is this? But I felt the kind of sympathy for this mm -hmm. lone figure. And, and <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. I could have completely misread it. But yeah, yeah. You know, that painting has been, and it's been interesting to see how people respond. I, we've talked about this painting. And uh, I feel like if I say how the painting is made or why it was made, it kind of undercuts how it functions in the world. Uh, I guess so in a way what I can say, what I can acknowledge is it's a painting that I don't know if I would have made even a year ago in the sense that uh, letting it exist at this state um, and also being comfortable with a, a type of, um, almost somewhat melodrama, yeah. you know? Like, I feel like I'm, I'm comfortable with drama, but I'm wary of melodrama. Uh, but I do love that space between the two, when things can become a little ridiculous, a little over the top, uh, you know, and there's a tension there. And I'm interested in kind of like poking at that a bit.
So you want to get to the melodramatic without being melodramatic. Maybe, or at least hint at that. Or hint at it. Yeah. Because there is a tendency for all of us to be melodramatic at a certain yes. moment, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm accused of that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that, well, being a poet, yeah. I know what I know about melodrama. <laughs> but I, you feel like, ugh, I don't want to go, I don't want to make a fool out of myself acting in this ridiculous way. Well, I think the the being a fool thing is I like that because I think um, I think um, uh, one thing that's become really important for me as a as I've developed as an artist is to with this idea of being open is being vulnerable. Right. You know, and what does it mean to be vulnerable? And um, which is you know is exposing how a painting is made a level of vulnerability is letting things not resolve into a certain expectation uh is that a type of vulnerability or um is in bringing out certain historical references that may or may not be legible in within certain social contexts is that a type of vulnerability right so i do uh, but also being silly and serious. Like painting is always kind of read as this serious enterprise because of its history across the world. Uh, and I'm interested in painting functioning as more like, um, I often think of it as like a alignment with a person that we hold different characteristics within us. So, you know, like, and even like, um, like being, I want certain parts of the painting to be seductive while other parts to maybe be a little jarring uh, or a little like, Ugh, you know, um, and how can you hold those things together? Right. The complexity yeah. and contradictions. Exactly. You want the contradictions. Yes. I, it's important. I want the contradictions very much. Yeah. And you also want to show, I mean, drawing... One, uh, an art historian once said to me, he's the curator at the Whitney uh, Museum, he said, uh, in drawings you show who you are, in paintings you can cover it up. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you show who you are often mm -hmm. by not covering it up and, and yeah. saying that painting. I mean, that's a vulnerable painting, it seems to me. Well, I think that's one thing, yeah, I, 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 I agree generally with that statement and I'm interested in painting being a place where that doesn't happen, where there is a level of vulnerability and openness across the board. Right, right? and yeah. I mean the other thing about your paintings is that they, they don't all arrive at the same level of quote finish. Right. And that's I think interesting because m many artists you go see a show, they all arrive at the same level. Mm -hmm. Right, like mm -hmm. they all, all the artist knows when they're finished, if right. when he when he or she gets to a certain point. Right. With these paintings, yeah. it's like it's not that clear to me right. that you're willing to actually, as you say, be open to mm -hmm. just say, okay, it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. But if you put that painting, say, if you only put that painting, that painting next to each yeah. other, no others. Yeah, there's a big difference between the yeah. level they've reached. Right. 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 And the right. viewer has to trust that or trust himself or herself in looking at that. Mm -hmm. Oh, he means both. Yeah. Well, I think that's always the, you know, it's like a movie and like, like certain movies end in a, uh, have a very clear ending and other movies end at a point where there's like a, it's like a fragment that like leaves the viewer hanging and we're like not sure and we have to keep talking. I love right. those movies where you leave and you're still talking, right. right? And I want, I think that's a really important way art can function in the world where it opens a space for conversation and dialogue and, and, and disagreements, you know? Uh, and then, um, and because then the work is actually active, right? right? It's not like I went to see something, a play or a movie or a performance or a painting and then I came and then I went to, you know, went to sleep, you know, right, um, right. like, you know, so I do think these. So what's the conversation? Let's go to okay. that. Okay. What's the conversation you would in your, when you're finished a painting, go and you think about what could be said about it. Mm -hmm. Cause we all mm -hmm. have that thought. 
Mm -hmm. What's the conversation you want to have starting? Because it seems to me it's a worldview. Mm -hmm. It's philosophical. It's about what art is. Mm -hmm. But it's also about how to live in this world. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think it's, I think, um, I mean, it's all of those things, obviously, but, but I suppose maybe at the core of it, I would like the work to pull you in, pull a viewer in, hold the viewer, and generate question marks in their head, and then, um, and then things, you know, hopefully that moves forward. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I want people to, you know, there are these, these gaps in these paintings, you know, and these are intentional breaks or overlays. Um, and they have, without overly um, kind of hitting the viewer over the head with symbol, symbolism, um, you know, there are these open spaces for action. You know, it's kind of like, you know, like I play this game with my daughter where, I, we, we, uh, where I'll start a drawing and she does and, and then we swap and then we, we keep working, right? Like we're both making space for each other to, complete, to continue a narrative. Right, um, and what Indian art, I mean, say as opposed to Western American art. So American art, it's Frank Stella, what you see is what you see. Mm -hmm. no lit it's very literal, no symbolism. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, as we were walking around the museum, we were talking about how intensely symbolic, mm -hmm. like every part of a sculpture has some meaning mm -hmm. and it has some long history and tradition. Mm -hmm. And you're the person that's come from, lives in these, or lived in these two worlds. Mm -hmm. One that's literal, mm -hmm. this is this, and that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And another world where this is not just this, it's mm -hmm. something else, right? And you're negotiating a right. complex space there, mm -hmm. and you want to kind of mm -hmm. bring both of it together, I would think, in yeah. some way. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, an example I can give, a very kind of a, a, a specific example is like, um, you know, um, when I look at a piece of, you know, there was a period when I was, when, that you're referring to when I was working with these kind of still life imagery, I made a painting uh, of um, basically a, a photograph uh, of my grandfather's um, um, living room in Kolkata. Um, it was just like, a, and that was um, in a frame and, the, and it was hanging on a, in my studio wall and the light was kind of reflecting my, my silhouette on the, on the glass. I think right. that's the painting you Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the a show. great painting. Um, so it's like, it's one of the, and I think this is something I've always been interested in, is that, well, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a portrait, a silhouette. We're also looking at an object uh, on a wall. We're also looking at an interior uh, that is within the frame. So there's these scale shifts happening. We're going between uh, object, image, photograph, photograph, physical realm, um, and something that's not even within the frame, right? Like the fact that the, the light's the, coming in. Exactly. So it's what's past the viewer, right? right? So I think that encapsulates maybe the way I think a lot, even when I move into, in, even within these works, right? Like I'm thinking about, like in that painting, how um, the, that kind of brown mass, just these marks, Mm -hmm. function, I'm like, mm -hmm. well, that's a head, like that can, that's enough, you know, or, um, but then where do I want to really delineate a marks of a hand or. And that hand, mm -hmm. and you feel like it's a gesture you've seen yeah. historically, mm -hmm. but you can't suddenly go, it's this. Right. Because it's kind of pulled, right. you know, and I think this idea that we're often pulled from places or we are pulled into places. And I mean, I think for me, that's, one of the ways I'm thinking a lot about is when I pull, extract something from an image, um, it's, I'm extracting a gesture. And even that, that act of extraction can be violent, but I think on the other hand, um, um, it can also be a way to bring forward. And I think it really has to do with intent, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whether this notion of stealing versus the, uh, the notion of carrying forward.
You want it to be both, though, don't you? Well, I think I think for me, like, I'm not really thinking about stealing. I'm thinking more about a kind of like uh, bringing something forward, back, okay. bring something forward. What yeah. about that painting? I mean, that painting is based on an image. Oh, that 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 one over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these both of these are linked. They're um, they're both based on this Kalikat painting tradition, uh, an image of uh, this woman with a broom. Chata, um, kind of looks like she's like hitting this guy. I think it's supposed to be her husband, but speaking with somebody here or during the exhibition, she was telling me, yeah, but it's actually, um, uh, they're like exercising, um, like taking a bad spells away. Um, and even just the idea that how something looks is not what is actually happening. I love that misreading, uh, that, uh, and I also like, and what I wanted to do is just play with the power dynamics in the image. Right. Uh, where there the woman's is, beating the guy. Well, yeah. <laughs> but then there's also this moment of tenderness, like yeah, with yeah, the yeah. hands and the feet. Right. So it's not just like a linear narrative of, uh, uh, of a kind of a power shift or, or, you know, but it's like, well, is, you know, that might be one component, but then as you move across, there's another part of this. So it's not just this one thing. Right, it's, you know, it's a more complicated relationship right. between these two people. Okay. Yeah. How are we doing on uh, time? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we should do one more and then do a pause and then I'd love to. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I've been asked to read some poems. Yeah. But so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about yeah. you before you get to me. Sure. And then we were thinking uh, you were going to... And, then, and yeah. then we could have questions and yeah. answers because we'd like to engage. Yeah. We, so it's we not, don't want you to just sit here and listen to us babble all day yeah. long. Yeah. I mean, we can do this love to talk. talk. Yeah. No. Uh, all right. What's so I want to go back to this. There is that gesture of her hand going down, almost like she's blessing him. Yeah. And then she's got this, you feel the other hand, something's up there that could come down and whop them. Well, that's, uh, that's also a very um, kind of a culturally specific gesture of like when you go into a home and um, whoever's the elder, you touch their feet um, ah, okay. for blessing. And this notion of touching somebody, if you're an elder touching uh, somebody younger, their head, like during, a, uh, during any kind of a, a religious event that's also a form of blessing so there's that there's this kind of you know so what's interesting to me is that you've made this painting that has a kind of specific cultural reference mm -hmm. and you live in america mm -hmm. and it's like many americans might not get that yeah. and you don't care yeah i think that's fine yeah. you know because i, I think, think that's important to yeah. say though yeah and i think i think you know the it's fact it's like you're not trying to assimilate Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, something can have multiple readings, right? And uh, and um, and I think I think it's good. For, I like the idea of having something function in the world that is open to different interpretations and different types and even misinterpretations. Um, and um, because all of that generates dialogue um, and also opens room for maybe knowledge uh, and information um, and you know somebody realizing that there's more there right um, and um, but I also like the idea of secrets you know like I don't think there is this often notion that um, that in order to um, be like this notion of privacy right like uh, or um, um, an exposing like the more you tell somebody about you the more um, this idea of sharing is something that is uh, wanted or that is, um, how should I put this? Okay, I'll put it this other way. That if you're, if you're somebody who's not willing to tell everything about yourself, you're, you're being coy or you're resisting. Aloof. You're being aloof and Remote. therefore, um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that's not nice, you know, like you should, you know, but, uh, but 
you have been thinking a lot about that, which is like, well, maybe not everything is meant for everybody, right? Like right. maybe uh, the world, you know, and the world that I want to exist within uh, accepts different types of um, information. And, and if you want to stay with the work, maybe there are places to go and, and maybe more questions to, will arise. Okay. You know. Is that it? I have to read now? Yes, yeah, please. You have to read now. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read from my most recent book of poems. It's called Tell It Slant, which is based on, a, as you probably all know, a Emily Dickinson, Tell the Truth Slant. But if you're Chinese American and live, the word slant can mean many things, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, and I'll begin with a. Uh, so I'm gonna read four poems. I'm gonna read just two sections of a poem <clears throat> called "Too Far to Write Down," and uh, it was written. I was asked by the Swiss artist Pia Fries to write poems for a set of prints that she did. Um, and so I'm responding to a particular set of prints that were based on an 18th century book about, Chinese book about the making of mulberry paper. Okay. I, humble scribe of clouds, ask permission to make my case. While you scatter ochre cumuli above black orchids, orchards and open huts, pull thick violet brush strokes through cascading green mountains. I watch my poems ferry fiery farewells downstream, dream that I am in two places at once, listening to new ghosts complain there's no room until the old ghosts leave their vestments behind, hear wisps of weeping, wind gathering in mulberry trees, become wrinkled sheep gloating above empty bed, watch victory and defeat unfurl flags against cold red sky as moon follows its hollow twin into a waterfall's marbled sections. I turn into drops of ink and snow settling into the repaired space of this poem. And then this, the, all the, I wrote eight poems in response and all of them begin with the same line. So this is to, I, humble scribe of clouds, ask permission to make my case. It does not matter if the poem's eyes are those of a dead fish. It sees that I am an idle dreamer jilted by flowers stretching far, sees me patch another layer of gauze to a mulberry tree eaten by moths, sees me kneel by a river and look at a face waging war with itself and long ago. I have become a dirty chair on which no one will sit, not even my stuffed parrot. Must I confess that I see you dancing in a poem that I have not yet written? This morning, I began washing away remnants of my cold mountain house. Can this memory become a blue flower floating in a pool of black ink? It is snowing in these poems, which were once branches catching the snow. Unreadable midnight, this part of the world you have not yet bid goodbye. I watch the river changing colors as if it can find itself, as if it can find inside itself another story to spill. And then um, the next poem I'm gonna read. It's called After I Turned 71 from Laura Mullen. And actually this is based on a misunderstanding. So I thought Laura said, I'm tired of you writing poems with images in it, which is not what she said, but being a paranoid as all poets are, I decided I had to write a poem with no images in it. I don't know if I succeeded. After I turned 71, I did not expect to see myself standing before a mirror. I looked like someone I would never want to meet. I wonder if I've made a mistake without knowing it. I'm sure the word disaster does not tell the whole story. 
I know there's room for improvement, but I decided to skip over that part. I realize this passport is the last one that will be issued to me. I begin to think the joke is not only on me. I can walk in any direction and still end up in the wrong place. I stop trying to make a list of words I will never use again. I decide making sense is no longer an acceptable form of lying. I think it's prudent to let others do the counting. I often tell strangers that I might start vomiting when the seasons begin to change. I agree that reincarnation is a scam perpetuated by life insurance companies. I liked it when the cab driver called me young, called me young man and gave him a smaller tip. And then the last poem I'm going to read is a... I'm very interested in this form called a pantoum, which is a Malaysian folk song structure in which every line is repeated twice in a certain order. And this is called View from the Balcony. And this will be the last one I read. We don't know how... <clears throat> sorry. View from the balcony. We don't know how often civilizations kill themselves, just that they do. We seldom stop and calculate moon's cold light traveling across the night sky. Thomas Edison is to blame. Electric lights turned our attention away from the stars. Counting them is tedious. How many do you think are lurking in clouds and dust? We seldom stop and calculate moon's cold light traveling across the night sky. Certain types of stars are like old cars, leaking carbon molecules into interstellar space. Counting them is tedious. How many do you think are lurking in clouds and dusts? There are more elephants in this room than the vastness can theoretically hold. Certain types of stars are like old cars, leaking carbon molecules into interstellar space. Ferdinand Magellan reported seeing bright circular clusters in the southern hemisphere. There are more elephants in this room than the vastness can theoretically hold. Most other civilizations that still exist in the galaxy today are likely young. Ferdinand Magellan reported seeing bright circular clusters in the southern hemisphere. Movie stars and films swap spit, but who knew that galaxies swap stars? Most other civilizations that still exist in the galaxy today are likely young. The origin of our galaxy is so old, we do not know what roads it took to get here. Movie stars and films swap spit, but who knew that galaxies swap stars? We're likely a frontier civilization in terms of galactic geography. The origin of our galaxy is so old, we do not know what roads it took to get here. We're relatively late, we're relative latecomers to the self-aware Milky Way inhabitant scene. We're likely a frontier civilization in terms of galactic geography. We don't know how often civilizations kill themselves, just that they do. We're relative latecomers to the self-aware Milky Way inhabitant scene. Thomas Edison is to blame. Electric lights turned our attention away from the stars. Thank you. So, so if you would like to ask questions, there's the smart guy over here and the <laughs> lesser smart guy over here. So please don't feel shy. Uh, this, this, these, these two paintings? Well, we didn't talk about it. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's because of too difficult for me to talk about so I'll let him talk about it can you um, can you lead with a question like uh, maybe to the right everybody can hear me is yeah. it like a shadow of the person or what how do you uh, 
in the right in the right yeah, 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 the right one um, so the painting on the right is called the meeting um, actually John um, in the in the catalog uh, John spends a significant amount of time talking about this painting and and also um, the title also refers to another painting uh, painting by Corbet but that's just a kind of a background information um, in general what I the way I talk about this painting is it's a meeting of two bodies um, um, in a way like in a literalizing meeting, uh, it's a self-portrait meeting, a character. Um, there's two different languages at play in terms of how the bodies are described. Um, and, you know, when I mentioned earlier this n notion of calling out um, an ancestor or ancestral character, I'm thinking about a mode of painting in India, specifically the Madhubani tradition, so I'm kind of using marks and methods that might relate to that. So in a way, I'm um, trying to embody a certain vocabulary that is not part of my direct methodology and trying to have this kind of work with each other. So there's a tension of vocabulary for me and also um, both of, um, in terms of how bodies are described um, and then there's a third element, which is on the left of the figure, um, you know, the kind of the brown figure is there's almost a suggestion of a third figure that is purely only described with these kind of broken lines. So I kind of read that as this third, um, like this ghost, um, maybe the painting itself um, is um, self-aware, you know. Um, and then the painting on the left is called Before the Meeting. And they're, they're separate paintings, but they're connected um, conceptually. They're, uh, they appear, if, if, it, if it feels like that they are mirrors of each other to some degree, they are in a way, because uh, the painting on the left is a, kind of a remaking of the painting on the right at an earlier state. So in a way, it comes after but it's of something before. So, you know, it's a different way of thinking about time um, and time of making and time and, and how, um, yeah, it's a different way of thinking about time. I'll leave it at that. Um, and it's a different type of uh, notion about, you know, how a painting is both, when I th was talking about gesture earlier, that it is in a way a complete performance, like uh, because I'm, making something that has existed before, but doesn't exist. So it, in a way, it's like calling that gesture out. So just the way, um, like calling out a figure from the past or from, from a different tradition, that is in a way like calling out the ghost of a painting back out, but then That's positioning it before the thing that came. That's all, I mean, it's based on a goose, I mean, it, it's inspired by this Gustave Courbet painting, which also makes a break with the painting in France, right, right. It's it's Courbet is on the road and he's met his uh, collector, and and the collector and his servant and the servants like the and it's it's a famous it's yeah. considered one of Courbet's most important paintings. Yeah, yeah. And yet, your painting completely reimagines it without any of those types in right. the painting. The there no, like, it has nothing to do with the kind of socio-political right. kind of narratives of class and and right, um, right and rank, right. Um, and the fact that they never really met. That, but that I like. I like the fact that uh, in a painting, things can happen that can't happen in real life uh, or never happened. You know, so. right? He, he he didn't meet this man on the road as he claims. Right. Exactly. And the man is dressed in a way that he would never dress standing on a dusty road. Right. He's very clean. Right. You don't dress like that. Right. He's very, yeah. yeah. Hope that. Thank you. Yeah, explains a lot. These yellow dots uh, appearing frequently, what do they mean? Do they have a special meaning or is it? I don't know what they mean. They're, um, they're, um, they're, you know, their moments. I don't know. Maybe I can think of them as sounds or um, overheard voices or For me, these are golden coins. I'm sorry? For me, these are golden coins. Ah, Dave, right? 
Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I think there was somebody, yeah. Yay, we like questions. The question is about the act and process of the painting. Uh, you have a peculiar choice of color and uh, some layers are uh, definitely uh, opaque, semi-transparent. Uh, some layers are more transparent, kind of. What what define what what guides you to the level of transparency? That I mean, there is a great play of transparency and opacity in your in almost every work of yours. Right, transparency, and opacity. Right. Mm -hmm. This time about transparency and yeah, opacity. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for asking that question because it's become really important for me to have that as a component in my paintings. Um, Name what it is in case the... Oh, the, the notion of different levels of transparency and opacity that you're referring to. Um, I think for me, it's a way of, the way I make that decision has to do with where, where we are visually, spatially in the painting. Like, where do I want to position the viewer? Um, you know, if we can like look through something, there's a sense of here, but then there's also a sense of there, right? We, we, are, we have an awareness of two spaces simultaneously, right? But if something is opaque, we're at a certain moment only, right? There's a kind of a singular singularity there. So, um, and then how that moment interacts with another moment spatially. So it's also about color, you know, like for me, color and uh, spatial relativity are co-linked or uh, are connected uh, or intertwined because um, the way I can't separate how color moves spatially with how marks move spatially uh, or how planes or, you know, I think of it as like, we can think of it as like a wall, a curtain, a window, uh, a dirty window and an open window, right? Like these levels of planes that have different levels of um, um, spatiality, right? Um, right, because not everything's on the surface. Well, I'm sorry? Not everything's, on a painting, yeah. the whole pr uh, pressure in the 20th century is right. only two dimensional, it's only on the surface. Right. Painting can't be a window anymore. Right. Right. And you're saying it can be many it can, things. It can be many things. It can right. be both. Right. Yeah. Like I want, um, you know, sometimes I say, I love the idea of a painting being a body. Right. But then, um, and in that sense, like um, how we have, like if you're wearing a jacket, like you have like little pockets and big pockets and, you know, or like uh, what's the space between your feet and the shoe or if you're wearing a hat or, um, you know, you, your inner ear, like this idea of spaces that we, like how we acknowledge something very quickly, but then there are the parts that slowly reveal themselves. And some of them we can't even see unless we are ourselves within that space, right? Like we only know what's in our pockets. Like, you know, uh, if there's change in it or if there's old receipts or whatever. <laughs> Pens. Any other question? I hope so. Yeah. Yes? Uh oh. Uh oh. I feel like this is going to be a tough question. Uh, yeah, I would like to go a little deeper into that question. Yes. Uh, because that's actually a question that I have very often for artists. Um, I mean, w what, what is your purpose, basically, when you paint? Uh, you want to basically, whatever, put down your thoughts, like seeing certain things, or you want to give the viewer a certain perspective, or you want to basically create a mystery, and you want the viewer to sort of be curious to what happens in the painting. And uh, so there can be very different objectives of, of an course, artist. Of course. Um, and sometimes you may be very egoistic and just say, okay, that's what I just felt at that point mm -hmm. in time. That's what mm -hmm. I wanted to 
put on the canvas and whether the viewer sees it or not, I don't care. Right, right. Uh, or you, you may, like many artists, uh, uh, paint decorative. They want to just have the viewer feel nice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And see, oh, that's nice mm -hmm. colors and that's why the painting may get sold. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what is your uh, philosophy of, of painting? What, what do you want to achieve for yourself? Mm -hmm. And what do you want to achieve for the viewer? I would say that maybe, well, I think I love that question. And I think there's a kind of a broader and then within individual paintings, they shift sometimes. I'm, I don't feel like I'm in complete control all the time as to how each painting will resolve itself. And I try to really listen to the painting. At some point, the painting, uh, I try not to control the painting. So if I pull back to your larger question in terms of purpose, um, I would say when you said, um, I want the paintings to function as a place where you, you come into, you come towards, um, I want definitely the painting to stop the viewer. Uh, there to be enough elements that, you know, you look at, you kind of have to, you know, it has to start there. And then enough things, there's a, and there's a relationship between things that you know and things you don't know, or you don't, you, or you can name versus you can, re, or you can uh, sense. And that begins to create this relationship between knowing and seeing or naming and seeing, as John put it earlier, um, and hopefully start where the viewer themselves are wondering, like, where am I? Okay, this is happening. Well, how does this relate to that? So um, it's a, it could be an internal dialogue uh, that is happening between the painting and the viewer. But if the viewer is with a group of people, then maybe it's like a broader social dialogue. And then if there are multiple paintings, then maybe you start to find certain um, overlaps or continuities um, and then begin to recognize certain associations. Uh, but it is important for me to the paintings to not to really function as questions um, and prompts um, as opposed to statements. Um, that being said, I think in some paintings, I want to really create a moment, a place that is really a moment. Like, so the paintings in that blue room and then the painting of the hands and the feet uh, um, really are about these more intimate moments while these larger paintings are really about a larger world, you know, where there are individual moments, but it's like a bigger world. Um, and, you know, painting like this, um, maybe it's a little, it pulls out a little bit, and it's really about a character that might play a part in a larger world, but here exists as a character. So I think of the paintings maybe as worlds, singular moments, portraits, um, and, um, and then the drawings functions at, uh, function as maybe parallel possibilities uh, that live alongside the paintings. How was that? Was that good? good. Hi, Sagram. Hi. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, thank you, firstly, for this conversation. Uh, I was wondering, um, you know, a lot of these, you've spoken about uh, most of these works in detail mm -hmm. and you speak about, you know, kind of stopping at one point mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so there is a great restraint in most of these works. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, what, what makes you like think that a piece is complete? When do you stop? Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, do you keep going back to the paintings over time and generally how long does a work take? Um, thank you. I, I feel like we talked briefly about that, right? Um, I think uh, I think restraint. Part of it is restraint. I used to think of it as restraint, but I think more of it now as being really specific and really being specific in terms of choice of how something is described. And maybe you know, I'm not a poet. But I imagine for John, choice of words are very important and how what comes before what and how that generates a, a thought and how it moves things forward. So 
um, it's important to me uh, how something is described says a lot about how we should feel about something. So for me, that painting over there is painted, the lines are made in a way that feel um, loose, I would say. Uh, they're somewhat casual. Um, they're kind of like, you know, not, it's not like a really careful observation recording of someone kneeling. It's almost like, like you're talking to somebody and just telling them about something that happened. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal, right? Um, so th that tone of it is important because it's a slightly, con it contradicts and is a contrast to actually what is what we're seeing is somebody in this highly elevated state of maybe anxiety or whatever, right? So I love that shift. Uh, and, um, and in terms of knowing when to, how long I work, yes, I do, I do work on multiple paintings simultaneously and I keep things at a state of flux for a long time. Uh, what I mean by that is everything exists in, a, in this kind of soup state uh, where it's like, I'm like, it's like making a sauce, like slowly, slow cooking and, you know, just letting things simmer, not being in a rush, not turning the heat up, uh, just let it be uh, until it helps me understand. I often have a sense of the general idea, but I don't know how I feel about it. And it takes me some time to understand what, how do I really feel about this, like to your question. Um, and, and in order to get to that, it takes time for me. Um, and I try to stop right before it feels like I'm in the past, right? I mean, one of the things that I think a lot about in, in terms of the relationship between painting and photography is the, is the, the they, they both can function as an image, right? But a painting is always a, uh, an after, it's, it's after the moment. Or, I'm sorry, a photograph is a past event. It's like a dead moment, right? Um, and, um, but a painting is an object, I think of it as an object and, is an, and really is in the now. Like it's happening, it's present, and it's active. Just like as a, a, a poem comes alive when it's read, either by somebody out loud or we hear it in our own heads or anything written, I think a painting comes alive when we engage with it, right? Um, and then uh, there's a certain, like, it becomes like, alive, it's open. It's like, and it's important for me to leave space for the viewer to enter. I think my question is a good segue because <laughs> um, there is this box that you have in the back, which is basically, I think you did it before you did the painting on the right. And I'm almost more drawn to the box because I tried to bend and look into it and see all the different corners of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to why you decided to, I mean, I'm assuming it's part of the artistic process of making a painting where you have mm -hmm. to kind of compose it before you get to working on it and it changes as you work on it. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm curious as to why you chose to make it a flat painting. And you talk a lot about space and in-betweenness and nowness. And I would almost imagine a lot of your works to be like physical, like, like things that you can physically walk through and experience as opposed to just flat paintings. Mm -hmm. And I guess, yeah, like what it, why do you choose to paint on a canvas as opposed to, you know, creating these like little moments that people can walk through and look through or even mm -hmm. flip through? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess in your entire like artistic career, how did you get to painting on canvas? Why did you think the, the, the diorama or that environment came before the painting? Part of me thinks that it came before because of how like kish and DIY it looks. Like there's some parts of the box that aren't covered with the book board, uh, mm -hmm. the book cloth. Mm -hmm. And then also there's things in the corners that you don't see in the painting. Uh -huh. And that almost makes me think that came before you were like, okay, this is where I want to go with it. Mm -hmm. But I might be wrong. 
So, no, 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 I'm, I'm just like, I'm really honestly curious because, um, so one way I would think of that is the, like there's these associations we all have with scale, like, or media differences drawing to painting. People think a drawing comes before a painting or we have associations just, you know, like, or something small leads to something big or something sculptural leads to something like that. And I'm interested in the contradictions. So the three environments are actually made after uh, the painting. So that, that's actually one of the, maybe the last thing I made before things were shipped here. Um, and they're made using um, just like the, the research material, basically printouts, things like that, that I had lying around. Um, and the purpose of it really is to just create another possibility. You know, it's, I like the idea of having a vocabulary that I'm really invested in, but then leaving a door open for something else. Um, you know, and I think if, for me, it's also a gesture uh, of saying, um, and, and, like, and. Um, and, and maybe uh, it's an opening um, for something to come. You know, I don't know, maybe it's a preview. Who knows, right? Um, and I think in terms of my relationship to painting, uh, you know, there's like a lot of different things which one can say no to. There's reasons to say no to things and there's reasons to say yes to things. And, uh, you know, for me, working on a format and a structure that has a very kind of clear Western roots um, is actually really important as something to push against. Uh, because it gives me both, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's something I can kind of like move, like, you know, because it's like when you come to a painting, already there's expectations of what it should do, right? Uh, how it should function. So I want to kind of push against that, right? And in order to do that, if I make something that is other, right, something else, then it's in conversation with its history, right? Whether it's sculpture or video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I like the idea of using something that's very old in a tradition and then pushing up against it. And because, you know, I, you know, I live in the West. I mean, I primarily live in the U.S. And, you know, I want to use a vocabulary or a, something that feels familiar and then, and then defamiliarize the viewer. And that's really important that, you know, like this, this classic idea of an magic trick, like, the magician will say something which is supposed to like create a narrative for the viewer, which is really a decoy, right? And then they do something and you're like, wow, how did that happen, right? So this kind of, this, this uh, swipe of right hand, or uh, oh, slide of, slide of hand. hand, right? And I think sometimes um, I like that you have a painting functioning like that a little bit. What do you think about that? Uh, um... There's this idea of the magician who pulls the rabbit out of the hat mm -hmm. is one kind of magic. Right. Then there's the magician who shows you how he pulls the rabbit out of the hat and it's still mysterious right. as how he did it. Yeah, I, like I, I think you're more in the second. Okay. Yeah. You kind of show how you do the painting, yeah. but we still go, how did he do that? Right, right. Yeah, like it's pretty straightforward. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? We have him here. He's a captive audience. Yeah, my <laughs> to the ground. Okay, I guess oh. that's it. So. All right. Oh. oh, one more. Oh, oh. No, no, ask it. We want to yeah. hear you. Um, I see. Painted frames around some works, and then some go right to the edge. Mm -hmm. um, some are geometric, and some look like, like windows, like you said. So I'm curious what leads to that sort of decision. So, and then there are like kind of suggestions of curtains. So um, I'm thinking, I think what's important to me is um, how to activate the perimeter of the physical object um, and what is the decision that's going to happen at the very edge that is going to generate 
like this, the specificity of the space that we are engaging with, right? So like, you know, the ones with the kind of a curtain structure is like sets up like the idea of something domestic or some kind of a, maybe a space you walk into is both theater and domestic. Um, for me, the ones that have just a threshold, like that yellow one over there, you know, you know, I'm thinking about the base of a stage, just that kind of element, like things are resting against that. And then uh, the ones that have a framing device is both obviously a nod to the kind of repeating, expanding frames in um, kind of Northern Indian painting from, um, and then also Persian painting and Rajasthani miniatures and all of that. But also it's a way to also activate this and pulsate the border um, to like really break the sense that things end here. But I like the idea that something can come in and function as a both a barrier. I'm thinking also about like how a curtain moves in the wind and things are bellowing back and forth a little bit. Um, and this idea of a like a telescoping the space that as we are we're both moving in and moving out simultaneously. So I think of it as like peripheral um, echoes of the space a little bit. Uh, so they're both kind of like formal spatial devices, but also maybe thematic and um, kind of like pointers. Okay. Nice. So um, I'd like to thank you, Sangram and John, for that very illuminating uh, conversation and to the audience for all your questions, I mean, I guess it just goes to show that the uh, talk had so much content that it also gave rise to all these, uh, you know, very intelligent and diverse questions. I mean, the insights you shared today made it even more meaningful. Thank you. And John, oh, thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you. Um,